this first panel is dedicated to populist rhetoric and its future as a possible new language of public politics. However, I think that before starting the conversation, I would very much like to welcome the five speakers of today's roundtable. Malcolm Bruce, Gisela Stewart, uh, Professor Andres Velasco, uh, Professor Anand Menon, and Sebastian Payne. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Through their statements, as well as the following discussion and Q&A session, we will try to grasp what the state of populist rhetoric is today. Interestingly enough, even though there is no consensus in the academic world about the definition of populism, all scholars agree upon the fact that populist rhetoric consists in an anti-establishment appeal and is based upon a division of the society between the people versus the elite. In other words, a rhetoric that just exposes ordinary citizens with an elite that has corrupted the political system and betrayed the will of the common people. Having understood what the populist rhetoric entails, we need to move a step forward. What are the effects that such rhetorical changes have had on the UK voter base? This is one of the central themes that we will be discussing in this panel. To put this into perspective, it might be interesting to look at some studies. In a research project undertaken in the Netherlands between 2008 and 2013, for instance, there are, um, there are some authors who found that political discontent is not only the cause of support for populist parties, but that it is also the consequence of the either left or right wing message of these parties. Hence, this would indicate that populist rhetoric has quite a negative impact on voters, fueling political discontent among citizens. However, the picture cannot be drawn that clearly. A more recent study that I found about that is published in 2020, 2020 trying to understand the relation between anti-systemic rhetoric of populist parties and citizens' trust in parliament, political parties, and politicians across the European continent came to a rather different conclusion. The others discovered that there is a significant positive effect actually of populist party success on citizens' trust, thus supporting in a sense the hypothesis that maybe populist party success might even act as a corrective force to the existing political system. And this effect is actually even stronger in countries where the democracy quality is lower, the corruption is higher, and government performance is weaker. So I think that to have a meaningful conversation on the possible effects of populist rhetoric on voters, we do need to have a nuanced account, including both positive and negative aspects. Having done so, we will then move on to another topic, namely the future of the political discourse in the United Kingdom. Is the toxic culture in parliament as labeled by then speaker John Burko here to stay? Even though the relationship between nationalism and populism is not that straightforward, we do see a shift towards a political rhetoric that researches uh, for reaches for emotional responses and that moves away from reason driven arguments. Is this the new mainstream? Do we see an adoption of these rhetorical, rhetorical changes by others than, let's say, the usual suspects? So I'm very, very much looking forward to this, this discussion with you, learning about your experience and insights what on um, what the future holds. So before getting started, there are some organizational issues. The panel discussion will be divided in a first section around 40 minutes long, where each speaker will have the time to present his or her ideas on these topics. And then a second part of about around 25 minutes where we will have the chance to take part 
to the disc you will have the chance as an audience to take part to the discussion and ask questions to our experts and uh, I really encourage you to write down your questions into the main chat and so uh, and now <laughs> without further ado I would like to introduce you to the first speaker uh, Malcolm so Malcolm Bruce was the MP for Gordon from 1983 until 2015 through seven, seven general elections. In that capacity, he carried a number of portfolios and served on many committees, notably covering economic affairs, energy and the environment and chaired the International Development Committee from 2005 to 2015. He was leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats from 1988 to 1992 and deputy leader of the Lib Dems from 2014 to 2015. And now up to you. Uh, sorry, you are uh, you're not uh, connected with the audio. Sorry, I thought you were unmuting me. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, it's occupational hazard at the moment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> apologies. Um, yeah, yeah um, thanks very much. But I, I'm obviously delighted to be here looking forward to the discussion, questions and exchanges, and also for what the other panelists have got to say. But uh, to begin with, uh, a few weeks ago, I heard a comment on the radio which resonated with me. It was short and sweet as follows. Uh, politics at its best involves compromise. And that in turn reminded me of something a political journalist said to me years ago at the start of my political career. I was complaining how hard it was to get attention or coverage of what I and my party were trying to get across. No change there. He said, I should recognize that our problem was that we were trying to project our ideas in three dimensions while our competitors thrived on two dimensional slogans. Of course, politicians always have and always will present the upside with minimal emphasis on the downside of their promises or actions. However, that is light years away from deliberate misrepresentation, being economic with the actuality, fake news, alternative facts, or downright lies. So when and how did this descent into darkness begin? And who is mostly responsible? The perpetrators? or that's the populist, if you like, or those who chose to accept the information at face value without any critical appraisal. Is the media, whether it's social or mainstream, the cause or just a reflection of the trend? Uh, much of society has degenerated into angry, polarized camps, brooking no compromise and demanding people conform to their woke identity slogans or resign themselves to being the, quote, enemy. Maybe it was the shock of 9-11 a turning point. The attacks were perpetrated for in, from inside Taliban controlled Afghanistan. And that made the case for taking action when the Taliban refused to engage. Yet disturbingly, attention turned to Iraq, which had no part in the attacks, but had been in the sights of the White House for other foreign policy reasons. A dodgy dossier, which dragged the UK into that adventure, paved the way for a destabilization destabilization of the Middle East, which shapes the world today. That's 20 years on. Then came the 2008 financial crash brought about by light touch regulation and greedy packaging of opaque financial instruments. Many people suffered, but not, it appeared, the perpetrators. And that was followed by the MPs expenses scandal. There was a real issue in the way MPs were paid and the allowances they could claim, and some MPs were rightly imprisoned, forced to stand down or fined. But nevertheless, it added to the anger in the land against the institution of Parliament itself, which has been turbocharged in spades by the Brexit debate. Then came the 2010 election and the first unexpected peacetime coalition government since before the war. And the parties, none of the parties, the country were not prepared for this. So although Labour had presided over the crash and had lost the election, they were enraged that the Liberal Democrats would enter a coalition with the Tories. So the demonization started with not entirely beneficial results for the left. 
I know from the inside that the Liberal Democrats fought to assert progressive policies and limit the hard right ambitions of the Conservatives. And among key measures were raising the tax threshold to help low earners, introducing the triple lock on the state pension, one of the meanest in Europe, in order to increase it in real terms over time, targeting resources and education to those from the poorest backgrounds, establishing the Green Investment Bank, the British Business Bank, and an apprenticeship and industrial strategy. None of this was acknowledged. The left denounced us as yellow Tories and fellow travellers for austerity, and the right took the credit for the provinces we provided and were happy for us to take the blame for everything else. Yet I would contend looking at the state of government and parliament since, I think the coalition over time will be seen as an interval of calm. The irony is this did not deliver a left-wing Labour government, but the collapse of the Liberal Democrats and a Conservative government with a working majority, which opened the door to a referendum on Brexit, which drew us into the extremes of identity politics and the abandonment of rational debate. And I'm not talking about just one side. By any standards, the Brexit referendum split the country almost equally. So to pursue such a fundamental change on such a fragile foundation called for cool heads and compromise, but they had left the field. Nobody really knew what Brexit involved. Brexit means Brexit, said Theresa May vacuously, adding offensively that if you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. But starkly, she said, we would leave the customs union and the single market and there'll be an end to freedom of movement. This was the moment for compromise to explore how we could leave the institutions of the EU, but retain close and constructive working arrangements. Instead, the Brexiters were declared the winners, even though they did not agree on what they wanted, and the rest of us were denounced as remoners. Calling an election to secure clarity delivered stalemate and paved the way for Boris Johnson, who made it clear he did not care either way how things turned out, as long as he got the top job. So populism has joined forces with nationalism. Johnson told us he had an oven ready deal, having rejected, rejected Theresa May's backstop for a border down the Irish Sea, which he denied. The election slogan, get Brexit done, certainly secured a winning vote from a weary public. In Scotland, where I'm speaking to you from, regardless of the fact that the biggest pro-Brexit vote came from SNP supporters, support for independence has risen, although the most recent polls suggest it might be faltering. The future of the United Kingdom is at stake, yet the largest unionist party, fueled by populism and nationalism, is the biggest engine driving it apart. The Scottish nationalists want another referendum, or say they do, yet have no coherent plan as to how independence would work, and just as the Brexiters before them forget that any agreement depends on what each side is prepared to offer, and the small party is inevitably in the weaker position. So how should those who want thriving liberal democracy face the challenges? Populist national parties have risen in countries as diverse as Hungary, Poland, France, Italy, Netherlands, Sweden, Estonia, and Germany, and of course the USA. In some cases, as they've been unable to match their rhetoric, support has subsided. Others have still to work through. But if your raison d'etre in politics, and I'm talking about myself certainly here, is to promote fairness, inclusiveness, and cooperation, the noise of populism makes it pretty hard to cut through until the realization dawns that it is only noise. The EU coined a soulless term, one of many I'm afraid, subsidiarity. I prefer to talk about localism, community and diversity. Brexit and COVID-19 have surely exposed the weaknesses of central control in England and Scotland and the strength of allowing decisions to reflect local circumstances. How else did we manage to betray our fishing and agriculture sector so badly, undermine our successful creative industries and drive financial services to Amsterdam and New York? Acknowledging the success to date of our vaccination program, which I'm happy to do, but it's been achieved by serendipity and allowing a small specialist group, which has now been disbanded, freedom of action. And it's not worked through yet, nor does it in any way compensate for the continuing failure of our track and trace system, mismanagement of lockdown and border control, and the appalling legacy of pretty well the worst death rate in the world. There is no guarantee that cool heads, common sense and pragmatism will reconnect. Lowering the temperature takes longer than stoking the fire. Yet we will never make good decisions if we do not acknowledge the reality of the problems. So to return to my opening remarks, life is three-dimensional. Two-dimensional politics will only build a house of cards. A three-dimensional approach will lay a firm foundation on which to build. Uh, I rest my case.
Thank you so much. Perfect in time. Uh, and uh, it, it's really, really interesting to see how the way in which politics is done and that in a sense, politic is, politics isn't in, the, in about compromise, but at the same time, it's so hard to get the message through when the noise is so loud. <laughs> so um, I would now would like to go to our next speaker. Who, uh, so to Anand, uh, I'll give you a short introduction. Anand Menon is the director of the UK in a Changing Europe, a research initiative that aims to provide an impartial and accessible reference point for all audiences interested in UK-EU relations, Brexit and its implications. He was professor of West European politics and founding and the founder of the um, director of the European Research Institute at the University of Birmingham before becoming professor of European politics and foreign affairs at King's College London. And uh, without further ado, <laughs> it's uh, please. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. Uh, Malcolm's put me to shame with his sort of reasoned, argued, and obviously well-prepared remarks. I was, I was toying with the idea of pretending to have a Wi-Fi failure as I listened to him, actually, because he's going to put me to shame, because I've just got a, a succession of rather unstructured remarks and observations, and because it's lockdown, I start every talk by apologizing, apologizing for my hair, which has started growing upwards now uh, for some reason. I, I'm not a great fan of the term populism, to be honest, but I don't want to get into some sort of esoteric discussion over... Uh, definitions, but I want to talk a little bit about the sort of politics we see now, the, the sort of rhetoric we see in politics, the levels of anger we see in politics, the disdain for evidence that Malcolm talked about, and the fact that politics strikes me as being more and more performative rather than substantive, uh, which is something that should concern us. First thing I'd say is, are these levels of anger and this kind of uh, sort of the sort of visceral nature of politics something new and as someone who sort of first became interested in politics in the 1980s uh i don't think it is uh this you know we sometimes go through these phases of very very angry politics and more more than that i would say actually that sometimes not sometimes but politics needs passion it is wrong to think that politics can simply be boiled down to rational discussions of facts and evidence passion is good and actually as dangerous for democratic systems, I think, is a lack of polarization. Uh, we see in several countries, you th think back 20 years to Austria and Jörg Haider, one of the reasons why you got populism in Austria was a profound sense that grand coalitions implied that everyone was just the same. So let's not lose from sight the fact that a degree of polarization is very, very healthy. You just need the right degree of polarization. So thinking about what's new in British politics, I think, broadly speaking, there are four things I'd I'd point to. Firstly, we now have two competing axes of contestation. Uh, the, the traditional left-right division of our politics has been supplemented by a new values or identity divide. And arguing over values makes for heated exchange and makes for deep divisions, as we've seen over the course of the last four or five years. And identity politics, which is closely linked to values, makes for less temperate, less reasoned debate and discussion. Personally, I'm not sure that having a dominant political cleavage based around values and identities makes for good politics. Uh, so that's the first thing I would say, because that's very, very deeply linked to Brexit. And as I'll say in my concluding remarks, one of the big issues about British politics is the degree to which the left-right division reasserts itself as the dominant sort of cleavage in party politics. The second interesting thing about politics now is, is, is what I see as the triumph of politics over aggregate economics. Uh, you see that in the decisions that our government has taken over both immigration and indeed Brexit, where political considerations triumphed over what in the past would have been the dominant concerns over what specific decisions meant for the state of the British economy. Uh, and this talks to a divide that you see around the world, the sort of focus on Wall Street rather than Main Street in the United States. Here in a debate that focused on jobs rather than on jobs that actually paid people a living wage to do them. Uh, and I think because of this dissatisfaction with the way we spoke about economics, as the way our politicians talked about aggregate economics, when we came to a referendum in which the chancellor was basically saying, 
why would you vote against the status quo? There are a number of people that could give them a number of good answers in response for that. Third thing I would say, a, a very, very high levels of anger with and a loss of trust in the system. Uh, this has had a pretty long history. I mean, you just in the short term, we can date it back to the impact of the financial crisis, the impact of the expenses uh, scandal. I think any, any contemporary political history of Britain has to play a large amount of attention to the year 2008, to the impact of austerity, to a perception that politicians feather their own nests, you know, unsuccessful politicians going off to very, very well paid jobs. Uh, furthers this sense of us against them. It hasn't taken politicians necessary to foment this sense of us against them. And I think what it's led to and what we've seen to a degree with the Brexit vote is the desire to sort of poke the establishment in the eye. Uh, and this isn't a failing of contemporary politics as much as it is as a failing of politics over the last 20 years. Politicians fail to be aware of the kind of problems that we now talk about following the Brexit referendum, but we should have been aware of long, long beforehand. Brexit spoke to, for me, to a growing frustration, not only with the economic settlement, but with an electoral system that left some people essentially voiceless. And as Malcolm says, I think, with a frustration that political decisions were seen as being taken far too far away from the people who were ultimately being affected by them. And finally, on tone, I think John Burko has a point. I think there are structural issues here. I think that the pantomime of prime minister's questions doesn't help in the least, uh, not least because I can't remember the last time that a question was actually answered. What we do about this new tone in politics, what we do about the fact-free nature of much political debate is a far harder question to answer. I'd say there are institutions out there like Full Fact that have become more important than ever, but we just need to be aware of the fact that people should have, there should be ways of fighting back against uh, emotional reactions to factual claims. It's very, very interesting, two weeks ago, the LSE put out a really good report on the economics of Scottish independence. Uh, and I remember social media was sort of eerily reminiscent of 2016 as supporters of Scottish independence, rather than criticizing the report itself or taking issue with its arguments, which you could easily have done, started to, attack the LSE or attack the authors or say the authors are based in English. They played the man, not the ball, in other words. And I think we need to be very, very careful about that. And I think we in academia in particular have a real important duty in trying to ensure that we debate the facts and rather than trying to attack the messenger. Where do we go from here? I thought Seb's story in the FT yesterday about the fact that the Prime Minister is changing his tone and why was fascinating. In a sense, it's quite hard, I think, Boris Johnson is realising to be anti-establishment when you are actually in charge of the government and that actually a greater focus on competence and a different sort of style might actually now be functional. At the same time, I think we can expect to see uh, Keir Starmer as, as try to move in the different direction, try to strike an angrier and more populist tone. Uh, one of the most interesting findings from the British election uh, studies latest wave was that 84% of Labour to Tory switchers in 2019 believe that there is one law for the rich and one for the poor. You can expect that kind of attack line quite a lot, I think, from the Labour Party in the two or three years to come. The fundamental question for me, to go back to where I started, is about whether values remain as dominant in our political discourse as they have been since the referendum. And here, I think the simple answer is we don't know. We're about to confront an enormous unemployment crisis as we come out of the public health crisis. That might well be enough to shift politics back to its normal axis of contestation, where we're talking about left versus right, levels of debt, levels of taxation, levels of redistribution. If that is what happens, then I suspect that our politics will change in tone as well, but I wouldn't bet on it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I, it's fascinating because uh, I also believe that indeed um, populism is kind of becoming much more performative, which is kind of interesting. And um, this uh, the starting point of uh, uh, the contestation as a not any more right versus left, but more part of values and identities, and that from there we could actually understand what might be the next uh, possible situations is very, very interesting. So thank you very much for that. Um, so our next speaker is Gisela. 
Gisela. Uh, so uh, she served as a non-affiliated peer in the House of Lords in nine, uh, 2019. She's also currently the chair of uh, Wilton Park, an executive agency of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, which provides a global forum for strategic discussion and the lead non-executive director on the cabinet office board. She was previously Labour MP for Birmingham at Eggeston. Oh my God, I don't know how to pronounce this. From 1997 to 2017 and served as a health minister in the first Blair administration. And she was chair of the vote leave during the 2016 referendum campaign. Thank, Thank you. you, Anna. And uh, there's only one thing you need to know about Edgbaston, and that is that it's the home of Birmingham University, where I first met Anna and all these many, many years ago when he was running the European <laughs> Research Institute. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, start this by sort of two quotes. Dur during lockdown, I started to watch Downton Abbey. Um, and there's a wonderful Maggie Smith quote in there where Maggie Smith leans back and goes and says, does it ever get cold on the moral high ground? And uh, a lot of the debate about populism at the moment sort of makes me wonder about, we're just getting a bit too much on the moral high ground as if this was something so new uh, and as if it was something for which we neither have any responsibility nor can do anything about it. And the second quote, and I kind of sort of paraphrase, is really Richard Feynman, the, the physicist, who kind of said that the essence of democracy is that it's not like natural sciences. There isn't a law of gravity which is uncontested. Politics and the way you govern and the way societies organize itself does not comply with state rules. And democracy in the sense that the most basic is that ever so often the voters say to one group of people, okay, you've had your chance, move on, and you give the other side a chance. So it is always contested, and it has always been also a function that you had to you had to protect yourself from democracy becoming mob rule. So that's why you have checks and balances. That's why you have institutions. However, what has happened in the last few years is is quite extraordinary. That a the language has changed from. You know, when I first came to England 40 years ago, if someone disagreed with you, they'd beg to differ. And then you would say something and someone would say, uh, well, I see this differently. Whereas now, if I say something you disagree with, particularly if it's anything to do with Brexit, then I'm lying. Oh, uh, one second, sorry. You, you muted yourself. I don't know if... I don't, I didn't touch anything. I couldn't have muted, but I'm, am I back now? Yes, yes, you are. You were so, saying when someone is against you, when you are, uh, especially about Brexit, and then you cut off. Uh, <laughs> oh, how, how telling. Um, it, it kind of, at that moment, rather than say, I disagree with you, the language says it's a lie, rather than a different interpretation. And I give you uh, an a, a example of that, political language and trying to persuade people has always used facts which are the most positive ones. Uh, but we are now living in a time where we can check facts more readily and more easily than we've ever done. But last Monday I was on German television and uh, the debate was about vaccinations and EU and COVID. And of course for the Germans in particular, the fact that the, the, the access to vaccines is so low is, is, is very difficult. So uh, a German politician, uh, I was asked, and Mrs. Stewart, when are you gonna have your vaccine? And I said, well, actually, is it happens tomorrow morning at 8.15? To which the response was in four sessions. One was, uh, the EU has vaccinated as many people as the UK, uh, which of course is right, except that if you've got a 60 million population base versus 350 million, it may just be something different. The second one was three months makes no difference. The fact that we're three months behind, that becomes a statement which is really very obviously contestable because you can say 
three months more of your schools closed, three months more of, of shops not being open. Well, maybe it does make a difference. But then the last two were the, the most beautiful ones, because then it said to me, well, of course, you won't get your second vaccine. And what you guys are doing just makes dangerous mutants more likely to develop. So from being a, a, a fact which was right, but somewhat taken out of context, to something you could contest, became to an accusation that the British were doing something which wasn't just dangerous for me, because I would only get one, but also dangerous for everyone else because we were creating extra mutants. And that's the nature of political debates. Uh, and that's why in order to counter that, you, you, the politicians carry a responsibility and so does the media. And so do we as citizens to, to just contest things and check them. But uh, we've got ourselves to the point where a lot of politicians in particular uh, kind of treat the voters if they were too stupid to understand. So not only are we accused of being liars, if you don't agree with me, it kind of means you're also too stupid. Again, when I first came to England 40 years ago, I always knew that I'd won the argument when they started to correct my grammar uh, because they weren't engaging in, in, in the argument anymore. And I want to say something about political parties here because I think they do play in that test between mob rule and democratic institutions an incredibly important role. Uh, it is the way where political parties are more than movements. Uh, you know, there was a real period under Corbyn in the Labour Party where I thought we descended to being a movement. Whereas if you're a political party, you carry responsibilities because you wish to be the government. And uh, Malcolm Bruce made a very important point about the coalition government in 2010. I think it will be reflected that for five years, the Lib Dems going in coalition with the Tories provided incredibly stable government, not least because the Lib Dems chose to have a minister in every department. So that the, 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 the battling of ideas happened amongst the ministers, but civil servants got fairly clear instructions. 2015, they were incredibly punished by the, by the electorate because standing there and saying, look what I've stopped from happening, it just isn't very appealing to the electorate. So uh, I would sort of leave you with uh, three kind of very basic thoughts. Uh, the, the first one is, it's no good just complaining about messages which are there. I think each and every one of us has a, has a duty to respond to them in a way. And, you know, we, we can check things. The second one, are very much uh, forgotten that political parties and their leaders and their members and the way we as political parties deal with our members when things go wrong is really, really important. And the third one is a more general one. And it's shamelessly, shamelessly paraphrasing Fukuyama when he was suggesting there was an end of history. There hasn't so much been an end of history, but there has been an end of the, the classic left-right divides between market economies and uh, centralized control. And we haven't yet found a, a new alignment which uh, kind of congregate around ideas because, and this is where I'm sort of paraphrasing Fukuyama, he kind of says, if you're fighting for ideas, when what your ideal was becomes true, rather than sitting back and, 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 and saying, oh, well, everything's fine now, we search for new battlegrounds. And I think that it's the absence of clearly expressed ideologies rather than being incredibly uh, uh, bureaucratic and saying, we just do better than the other side. It just simply doesn't uh, appeal to electorates. Thank you very much, Gisela. And I, uh, it's fascinating to hear you talk about this very concrete example of how political languages has changed uh, with your interview uh, with the German, uh, with the German public, and the way in which basically from one moment to the next, you're not only someone who sees things differently, but actually who is accused of being really much basically most mostly an enemy. <laughs> so very, very interesting indeed. Um, well, yes. So our next speaker is Andres. 
Um, so Andres Velasco is Professor of Public Policy and Dean of the School of Public Policy at LSE. Uh, he ran for the presidency of Chile in the in June 2013 primaries and was also the Minister of Finance of Chile between March 2006 and March 2010. During his tenure, he was recognized as Latin, Latin American Finance Minister of the Year but several in, by several international publications. Uh, and he is the author of nearly 100 academic articles, several academic books, and two novels. Thank you very much. You are still on mute. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me and including me in this absolutely fascinating panel on a topic that could not be more interesting. Let me apologize at the outset by saying that I am not going to talk about populism in UK politics. Uh, everybody else on this call is much more qualified than I am to do that. Um, Gisela was telling us she came to the UK 40 years ago. I came to the UK less than 40 months ago. But I do want to talk about populism in the world, not just to make an academic point that populism is a worldwide phenomenon, but also to emphasize that there are lessons from populism elsewhere that may have some bearing and some relevance, relevance sorry, as we think about populism in the UK, in the US and other countries in the, in the Anglosphere. Let me begin by what I think is the wrong interpretation of populism. And this is uh, a very prevalent um, interpretation, both in the US and the UK. And it views basically populism as the natural and inevitable reaction to economic pain. We had a big crisis 12 years ago, the world financial crisis. Ever since, incomes have been growing slowly. Ever since, many regions of, say, the Midwest and the US or the North in England have been left behind. The rich presumably have been getting richer, the poor have been getting poorer. And what do we get? We get populism. The implication of this view is that if you fix economics, populism will go away. If you do away with the nasty bits of globalization, the problem will have been solved. I think this is exactly the wrong way um, to look at populism. I'm not doubting for a minute that many people have had a terrible time with the crisis 10 years ago, that the world economy has become uh, more unfair, and that of course people are having a terrible time now with the second massive crisis of COVID. But if we lift our gaze beyond the North Atlantic, we're going to observe that there's populism around the world, and populism is happening in countries with a bad economic performance, but it's also happening in countries with a very good economic performance. I would qualify as populist regimes in countries like Turkey, India, Poland, Hungary, the Philippines, Brazil, and many others, of course. You know, I hail from Latin America, Venezuela is populist, Argentina is populist, Mexico is populist. But if you think in Turkey and the Philippines, these are countries where economic growth between 2010 and the pandemic was over 7%. Uh, Poland and Hungary had some of the best economic performances in Europe. These are countries that are, of course, winners, not losers from globalization. Nonetheless, you're seeing populism rage there. Brazil is not a country with great economic growth, but it is a country in which a succession of left-leaning governments did a bit uh, not much, but did a bit to um, stop income distribution from getting worse. In fact, at some point, uh, Obama called Lula the most popular politician in the world when Lula was the president of Brazil, precisely because uh, inequality is coming down. Nonetheless, uh, Brazil is today in the throes of a right-wing populist experiment. So populism is really a problem of politics. It is not exclusively a problem of economics. And once we see it that way, um, the uh, obvious, I think, takes center stage. Namely, if it is a political problem, it requires political solutions. Uh, and therefore, I like the fact that this 
panel is called the rhetoric of populism because of course discourse rhetoric and the spoken word are absolutely inseparable from politics so what is populism in this political style hannah in the beginning said three things with which i think most people would agree uh, populism is anti-elitist it is anti-expert it is anti-outsider it is, if we quote uh, Jan Werner Miller, the uh, Princeton professor of politics, uh, it is the worst kind of identity politics. It is us versus them. It is a politics of division, uh, not as Joe Biden would have it, a politics of unity. In this sense, populism is distinct, but it is not entirely different from fascism. The uh, respected Yale philosopher in the US, uh, a man called Jason Stanley, just published a book, which of course is about Trump, even though he doesn't say that. The book is called How Fascism Works, and the subtitle is The Politics of Us Versus Them. So Trump is about division, is about the, work, the worst kind of identity politics, uh, and so is populism in India, in Turkey, in the Philippines, in Brazil, and in many other countries in the world. Now, going beyond that, I'd like to add three bits, which in my view are central to populism as an approach to politics. The first one is a denial of complexity. You know, I, I run a school of public policy in London and, uh, you know, I teach my students that the world is complex and that they're paying the LSE uh, a lot in tuition every year because we are teaching them to deal with the complexity of public policies. And if the problems are complex, of course, the answers will need uh, complex policy responses. Populists, on the contrary, say exactly the opposite. They say the world is simple and therefore social problems um, have simple answers. Take Trump and migration. Everybody on this call would agree that migration is a complex issue. It has to do with economics and politics and demography and sociology and climate change and all of that. But for Trump, it is a simple problem. It is evil Mexicans and evil Central Americans coming across the border. What you do, you build a wall. Simple solutions to simple problems. That is very much of the essence of populism. If you believe in simplicity and deny complexity, you're also going to deny pluralism. Because pluralism, the idea that people have different views and these different views are legitimate, naturally comes from complexity. If the world is complex, uh, it is admissible to have different views on things. If the world is simple, there's only one view, there's only one solution. Anybody saying anything else is clearly uh, an agent of evil, an outsider, a member of a corrupt elite, so on and so forth. So the very essence of populism is a denial of pluralism. And the third component, which is exactly kind of the outgrowth, almost the inevitable outgrowth of that, is a refusal to accept the checks and balances that are essential to liberal democracy. Because if the other guy has a view and that view is illegitimate, uh, well, we cannot allow that person, that group, that party to keep espousing that view in public and therefore checks and balances, autonomous entities within the state, electoral commissions, uh, and all kinds of bits and pieces that are, uh, you know, beloved to liberal Democrats become inessential. And that's exactly what we're seeing in India, we're seeing in Turkey, we're seeing in Mexico. We saw to a dramatic extent in Venezuela and in other corners of the world. So if this is a political problem, and this is what, um, you know, pluralism uh, is losing and what populism is gaining, what is to be done? I only have one minute. Uh, to deal with the question of what liberal Democrats, liberal Democrats with a big L and a big D and also a small L and a, and a small D, people who believe in liberal democracy, what can you do? Let me just simply list very quickly four possible answers. The first one is do not retreat into technocracy. There's a quote by a Trump advisor that I always cite. He says, in an election between a guy who says, I have a 10 point plan to fix this problem and a candidate who says, they're all thieves, kick them out. The populist candidate will win. The candidate with a 10 point plan will, will lose. 
Secondly, and this is something a couple of the speakers before me emphasized, and I want to agree, we should not fear emotion. Everything we know from brain science, from cognitive scientists, etc., tells us, and we've learned this over the last 25 or 30 years, that the human brain functions in a way that makes reason and emotion inseparable. And therefore, in politics, reason alone will not do the trick. Emotion is too important. We cannot leave emotion exclusively to the demagogues. Third point is that we have to ask, well, if we're going to be emotional, emotional about what? Clearly about other human beings, about the community in which we live, which, tells, which leads me back to the issue of the nation state. Many liberal Democrats mistakenly, in my view, have uh, immediately progressed to planetary politics or to the politics of the EU, which is kind of planetary. Ultimately, people care about the community in which they live and the nation in which they live. So I think the liberal democratic response has to be patriotic, which of course is not the same as nationalist. Orwell many years ago said that patriotism is love of country, nationalism is hatred of the country next door. I'm not advocating that liberals should be nationalists, but yes, we ought to be patriots. And last but not least, and I will end here, we have to think hard at, about how it is that we reform democracy to make it both more effective and bring it closer to voters. And I want to agree with one thing Gisela said at the end, political parties are absolutely key to democracy. Political parties are in shambles pretty much everywhere. Without political parties, we will not have an effective liberal democratic answer to the problem of populism. And I want to emphasize that it is a problem Populism is entire, you know, essentially anti-democratic, and uh, it merits a very determined policy response. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andres. Um, I think it's very, it's amazing how we can really understand. I think populism uh, in one country, as if we th think about it as a global phenomenon, and we just don't. Uh, we understand how all the things that we see around the world actually can ha have such a great impact on the way in which we can not only analyze populism, but actually counter it. So thank you very, very much for this. Um, and so we go on to our final, uh, our final uh, speaker, uh, Sebast Sebast Sebastian. Sebastian Payne is the Whitehall editor for the Financial Times. He writes about British politics. He also presents the weekly Payne's politi politics podcast and writes a fortnightly notebook column for the Financial Times opinion pages. He has a forthcoming book entitled Broken Heartlands, A Journey Through Labour's Loss, England, which is due to be released later in 2021, and comments on the traditionally safe Labour seats in Northern England that voted Conservative in 2019. Thank you very much for having me. Um, there's been so much great stuff so far. I'm not entirely sure what I can really add to that that's, um, that will sort of move our thinking on because it's really, really interesting. But I'd like to just give you some personal observations on populism and populist rhetoric in British politics based on my own reporting experiences. Now, it feels like um, a complete lifetime ago from where we are now, where COVID dominates everything and nearly all politics is virtual. But if we go back to the Brexit wars, which were those days in 2019, they felt completely endless. And it was the moment when Britain's body politic had something of a nervous breakdown because Theresa May had spent two years trying to negotiate a Brexit deal. Uh, she got the deal and um, she called a general election in the midst of that and didn't win a majority, but still kept plowing on. She lost Boris Johnson, lost several cabinet ministers, lost many of her own MPs. And we got to this point where night after night she tried to get that deal through the houses of parliament and it failed to get a parliamentary majority and it felt to pundits and observers like me to ministers that there probably was a majority for her deal within the house of commons that when you looked at the instincts and the um the motivations of mps and labor party conservatives and elsewhere it felt as if 
it could get through, but you had to get the right conditions to get there. And the reason you got to those conditions was ramping up the rhetoric and really raising the political heat. And the reason to do that was to try and get those Labour MPs who were not really too enthusiastic about her deal over the line to say to them, look, it's no choice. It's either this or no deal Brexit. So we had deadline after deadline to try and bring politics to that very tense moment where they had to sort of hold their breath, go in and vote for the deal. And for conservatives, the idea was to really ramp everything up to that final point at which it said it's this or no Brexit, because if you don't vote for this deal, then there could be a second referendum and you lose this thing. Now, the effort of raising that temperature, which was done by the prime minister, by by the whips, by the parliamentary managers may have been necessary, but as we know, it ultimately failed. But it did create this conditions that I think was quite dangerous at that point in terms of probably the most populist moment I can remember in British politics over the past decade, because this is when we got to the point where we had rhetoric such as enemies of the people, people who are betraying the rhetoric, uh, a lot of treacherous rhetoric came forward and you can remember all those parliamentary exchanges which were very, very visceral between both sides here. Now, it could have been that it was impossible to pass that Brexit deal. Maybe there wasn't a majority and people like me were wrong. Maybe it was Theresa May's lack of political acumen that she was able to get everybody into that place to finally vote for a political deal. But what's most interesting is just how nasty that moment was. If you remember, there were MPs like Anna Subri, the pro-Remain Conservative, who was hounded down the pavements of Westminster by far-right activists. The whole of Parliament was surrounded by people shouting day after today people who didn't seem to have any jobs or anything better to do spent day after day hurling abuse at the tv cameras and at first i thought this is actually a great carnival of democracy isn't this a wonderful thing for political nerds like me to see this happening but when you look back at it on retrospect it probably wasn't a good thing, in fact, because it's really sort of entered this populist moment. And it refers to, I think, what Alan was talking about before, the identity divide, where everything at that moment, when Brexit moved from being a policy issue to an identity one, really came to the fore and created the circumstances that led to the 2019 election. But before we get to the 2019 election, I think the zenith of populism in political sense was probably the Brexit party. So this was Nigel Farage his most um, successful endeavour as he le led the UK and the Independence Party for many years, campaigned for Brexit from the outset. But at about March 2019, when we were at this moment when it just seemed as if you couldn't get Brexit through the House of Commons and there was no national consensus on whether it should be Theresa May's deal, a looser Brexit deal, a closer Brexit deal, a second referendum, whatever it may be, Nigel Farage entered the foray and created this new party, a pop-up party, if you like. Now, one issue parties are not a new thing in British politics, but I think the Brexit party took this to new heights. They went from a standing start at the beginning of 2019 um, to basically winning those European elections in May. And those European elections resulted because of that parliamentary stalemate. He managed to push the Conservative Party into fifth place, which is really quite extraordinary. Um, and they got 30% of the vote with no activist base, no, um, no history beyond Farage's personality and you know the effect that had on British politics cannot be underestimated it essentially ended Theresa May's premiership and it created the conditions for the very rapid rise of Boris Johnson if we remember the Brexit party slogan which was a clean break Brexit that's very similar to get Brexit done which the Prime Minister started saying just a couple of months later and I think when you look at what Nice Farage was talking about it was very simple language the sort of thing Andreas was just talking about there that it was saying the world is simple we simply just need to get Brexit done have a clean break and it will all be fine and everybody will agree there are trade-offs involved with Brexit and you can have much of a debate about whether those trade-offs are worthwhile but Farage didn't paint any of those and I think it's very important to look at that moment and the effect that had on right-wing politics for what really came next so there was a feeling within the Tory party at that moment that this might be it for the Conservative Party the, the you know the oldest political party in the world might have come to the end of its days it might seem ridiculous to think of that rhetoric now but at that moment they 
felt that their raison d'etre, Brexit, delivering on that vote, had been overtaken by this pop-up party that was appealing not only to their traditional voters, the kind of middle-class Eurosceptics who live in the home counties around London, but also working class England, which are the places the Conservatives have been advancing their vote for quite a long time. So that brings us to Boris Johnson and this question that several of us have touched on is, is he a populist prime minister and is he a populist administration? Now, the morning after he won that general election in 2020, there was a rally where there was full of drunken conservative activists and people high on their own hubris, if that's not too rude to say. And they unveiled this slogan, which was the people's government on this big slogan behind. So I remember one advisor involved in that campaign said to me, even I wondered if this was going a little bit too far, but that is a classic populist trope, isn't it? About pitching yourselves on the side of this mythical the people against the mythical establishment. And of course, the whole thing is so ironic when you've got a prime minister who's doing this, someone who rode on the coattails of that um, Brexit surge that started with the Brexit party and I guess going further back with the 2016 referendum. The Tories have always had a bit of a popular surge to them. You know, one historic example is Benjamin Disraeli's embrace of the empire as a kind of motivational sense to get people out beyond the sort of drier things of taxation policy and trade and that sort of thing. But I still think the jury's out about how Johnson is going to govern in this sense, because the pandemic has forced him to become a much more conventional prime minister. You know, obviously the experts are now very much in vogue. And it was very striking that when Chris Whitty and Patrick Vallon started appearing um, beside Boris Johnson at those early press conferences, they were called by people in Downing Street, Boris and the Boffins. And they were saying, isn't this great having these people here who have got all the expertise and are trusted? And of course, if we think back to the 20th 2016 referendum that was not quite the attitude that we had at that point but then of course we had the clear out of lots of the people associated with the vote leave campaign from Downing Street that it was obviously Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane who were the two key advisors behind um, vote leave and they tried to import some of that populist simplistic messaging into government it didn't work they th their efforts to transfer that from campaigning to governing I think was widely seen as a failure and um, their, their strategy with the civil service with the media with the parliamentary party didn't fail and the people who have replaced them are much more conventional conservatives and as and I'll mention the piece that I've written the FT this morning there is a feeling that we are going to a bit more of a traditional traditional Toryism now with age who are much more willing to work with the civil service, work with the state and just essentially not be populist in their rhetoric. But I would say that Boris Johnson does have some instincts that tend to be a little populist. You know, he was a former columnist after no. He knows ideas, he knows slogans that grab the headlines and grab people's attention. But fundamentally, the characteristic that drives the prime minister above everything else is being liked. He's some, which is quite an odd thing for a politician, but really above all else, that's what he wants to do. And so I think he likes playing a bit of divide and rule, a bit of culture wars here and there, talking about statues, renaming roads, that sort of thing. But when it comes to it, he wants to be the guy who is liked by everyone. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. I'm just gonna rattle through my points very quickly. One thing I think is going to be interesting to watch over the next couple of years is about whether COVID has created new but skillism for domestic and economic policy. This is one of the big themes of my book that's coming out later this year. That if we look back to the 1950s when the Conservatives' Rab Butler and Labour's Hugh Gateskill, they essentially didn't differ on economic policy of that day and much domestic policy too. And I do wonder if we're entering that similar kind of era again, because Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson, fundamentally, they are not disagreeing on COVID policy. Yes, they're having arguments about when you should lock down, should you do this, Captain Hindsight, Captain Foresight, whatever you want to call it. But fundamentally, you've not got one party saying we should be locked down and we should be opened up. One party saying we should be spending 400 billion, the other party saying we shouldn't. They agree on all these key issues and I think when normal politics resumes later in the spring in the summer the dividing lines are going to be really interesting to watch because on economics the Tories have jettisoned a lot of the past four decades you know Thatcherism is sort of now being buried by Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak who are both people who went into politics driven by Margaret Thatcher 
We know the NHS is going to be bigger for a lot more time. We know the state is going to be significantly bigger. So where are those dividing lines going to be? Yes, it might be on cultural issues. Yes, it might be on personality and patriotism and how much you love to wrap yourself around a Union Jack flag. But I think it's going to be a really interesting debate to see because at the moment, there is a lot of consensus and it's not quite clear to me where that dividing line is going to be. And again, how do you create populism? How do you sort of stoke division when actually you're agreeing on the final, on most of the things? Which brings me on to my final topic now, which is the next general election. Because what we've seen in the past couple of elections in the UK is what I think of as maybe uber sloganeering. And this is something that happens on the right of British politics. Now, slogans are nothing new, as we were talking about earlier. This has been seen for a long time. People will love to distill down to easy sound bites that campaigners can sell on the doorstep and cut through complicated policies. But I think what you've seen with the Tories is taking this to a new degree. And this was something pioneered by Linton Crosby, the so-called Wizard of Oz, who has been their main election guru in 2015, 2017 and 2019. His strategy is to scrape the barnacles off the boat, as he calls it, which is to get away talking about anything that is complex, anything that has nuance, and just get really simple messages straightforward. So in 2015, of course, it was long-term economic plan. That was his way of selling David Cameron and George Osborne's strategy for stabilizing the public finances after the financial crash. But that, of course, didn't really speak to the trade-offs that were required with austerity, the trade-offs with taxation, and the trade-offs with public services services, which I think manifested themselves in the 2016 Brexit vote, which, among other things, I think was a big clarion call against the austerity they had put forward. In 2017, we had strong and stable government, which is another favourite slogan of Linton Crosby's that he used in Australia. Um, it was all about Theresa May's hope stabilising that so a torrid atmosphere following Brexit. Uh, the slight problem was he didn't have a strong or stable leader there. And I think we've seen pretty rapidly that there was a slight issue of the Emperor's New Clothing. They put forward this idea that Theresa May will take the tough decisions, lead the country through this, but she lost her majority. And when it came to the big cause in terms of government, she didn't really get any of them right. And then, of course, in 2019, we had Get Brexit Done, another Linton Crosby classic that actually came, I think, out of a focus group in the suburbs of Manchester one dark evening when the Tory campaign was saying to people, what do you want? And they just started to say, oh, I just want to get this done. I'm sick of politicians. I just want to get Brexit out of my life. And of course, they said, you mean just get Brexit done? And then everybody in that focus group said, yeah, just get Brexit done. And this was a focus group of floating voters. And of course, that's where the slogan came from. Uh, it was saying really Boris Johnson would do what Theresa May couldn't do in getting it done. Uh, but again, it doesn't speak to the real world trade-offs about this. And we're obviously beginning to see this here. And I think there is a slight problem that, again, you can make a coherent argument for Brexit and saying in the longer term, it's the right thing to do. In the longer term, getting back our sovereignty is the right thing. You can also make the argument in the shorter term that the economic pain to get there is not worthwhile. But this sloganeering, this uber sloganeering, doesn't speak to that. Boris Johnson didn't talk about trade-offs for fishermen. He didn't talk about trade-offs for British musicians. He didn't talk about border friction. All these things we're beginning to see now. Now, the government hopes that that will all settle down and come the next election. Um, they can really simply say, look, we got through the bumps. It's all fine. Uh, but again, in elections, there's nobody's really doing that. And I think it's be fascinating when we come to 2024. Are we going to go back to this uber sloganeering where we have another slogan? And the sort of things you could imagine are keep Brexit done. You've heard Boris Johnson use mm -hmm. that a little bit. You could even have keep Britain great which is very sort of Trump-inspired slogans, but very much speak to what Boris Johnson is about. But if we do have that kind of unity around yeah. domestic and economic policy, this new butskillism that I <laughs> talked about, and I think that's going to be pretty interesting to see. Anyway, I've run over. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm so sorry. It's very fascinating, everything. But we do need to have at least a couple of minutes for the audience to get involved uh, in our discussion as well. I um, so I would like uh, I would like to take on one very interesting question uh, here that I see in the chat, please continue sending uh, questions. We do have the time for at least in about 10 minutes, we will have to finish this panel discussion, but I really would like to get some questions over. Um, and I think one of the most, I will, 
something that really strikes me as well is about the some of you have talked about Andres and and Gisela. We have talked. You have talked about the fact that there's a irresponsibility of political parties to basically get us counter in a sense populism but in the same time there's an, a, a feeling that populism has indeed basically uh, entered mainstream political parties we can think about maybe the republicans in the in the united states but also we're seeing this with uh, boris johnson as maybe one uh, uh, indeed a populist and so in in a sense if the aim uh, so if populist parties are not only taking on this, but also basically using this because populism works in a sense to get into, uh, into uh, power, so why, should, why would they be, be the ones countering this? H Hannah, can I come back and say, it has always been the function of the Labour Party to absorb the loony left and the function of the Tory party to absorb the loony right. Th that is part of the, the, the structures of political parties. And because if you wish to be the government, you have to make those compromises between raising taxation, economic performance. And, and I want to say something in defense of slogans, by the way. Um, slogans only work when they actually hit a resonance what people out there think. So Seb pointed out that strong and stable uh, uh, applied to a croaky Theresa May just didn't work, work because there was anything other than strong and stable about her. However, I want you to go back to the 1997 election when Tony Blair, uh, during the campaign, we had pledge cards and there were five pledges at the back, which at that stage were, were terribly uh, you know, innovative. However, there, there never were pledges, by the way. They were containments of fear. If you go back to them, you know, they were about as modest as you could be and certainly not worthy of delivering a landslide. You know, we, we're going to reduce NHS waiting lists by 100,000? 100,000? We're going to have waiting, you know, school classes of 30. But what it was, we looked at 92 why we lost the fears of the electorate and our pledges were part of containing. So the political parties have a responsibility for the fringes of the extremes to embrace them and, and kind of take the oxygen away from them. But then they will need slogans to deliver simple messages and the slogans only work if they're actually underpinned by something that the electorate also feels. Is there someone who wants to jump into this maybe? Just just one thing. I, I thought it was interesting that <clears throat> populism is defined as the people against the elite in the establishment, yet the most successful populists are pillars of the elite in the establishment. So uh, it's extraordinary how hypocritical, if you like, their position is, um, pretending to be on the side of the people when in fact they're not in that sense. They don't come from that background. And yet, and people can see that, and yet they don't quite know how to deal with it. And I think picking up on Giz what Gisela says, I like the idea that it's the job of the two main parties to contain their lunatic fringe. And I, I, I think there's quite a lot of sense in that, but they didn't. Um, and usually when that happens, it creates space for what I hate to call the center, but you might say, you know, the, the, the moderate positions, but quite the opposite has happened. And I speak obviously from personal pain, that has been almost crushed. Um, and that's what worries me is that if, if that calm compromise is not no longer acceptable to the voter, um, it's difficult to see how normal politics can be resumed. And that, I, I, I mean, I just can't see that it's as predictable as that. And I, I look at, for example, the Labour Party now struggling really to find out how they temper themselves against Boris Johnson. And he in turn is struggling, as Sebastian said, <laughs> to decide whether he's populist or statesmanlike. And he's both at different times of the same speech. Um, so I, I, I think we have quite a way to go before this settles down. So I think I think there's a lot of churn going on and and ultimately, and I did say that in my open remarks, there is a responsibility for voters as well as politicians. And the disengagement of the electorate is a problem because they're prepared to accept clearly um, 
false information. And I, I take Gisela's point that how extreme people react. But, you know, there are some ridiculous facts put out there which are easily challenged. And I can tell you in Scotland, with the surge of nationalism, it is just unbelievable the stuff that people are buying into um, about what they think it's all about, without question. Scotland is richer than England. You didn't know that, but it is. Scotland, if it was free from the shackles of England, would be a world power. Scotland would be able to rejoin the EU and be a major player. All of that, and people believe it, without question. I think there's, we need to look at two sets of rules as well here. I mean, firstly, the rules for selecting party leaders. Uh, and I think internal party democracy uh, is, is one of the reasons why our politics took the form it did over the last five years, which is to say you're, you're empowering the militants. Uh, and so we shouldn't therefore be surprised if parties end up at variance with your median voter, because the median voter has got nothing to do with the process of selecting who's in charge of the party. And equally, if you end up with that situation of polarization between the two parties, then you probably need to start thinking about the electoral system as well, because the center as Malcolm referred to it, then ends up divided equally between the two main parties. But the logic of two party competition under first past the post, as we saw during the parliament that Seb described, meant that it was impossible for those centrists on either side to work together because loyalty to party trumps loyalty to the centre. I just wanted to come in very quickly on that, just to say, um, I think this thing about being establishment and anti-establishment, again, it, it's something that happens quite a lot. And uh, my view on this is that there isn't a single British establishment anymore, um, that there probably was something that, you know, has obviously been written about in the middle of the 20th century. But my view is there's actually a series of establishments now which interconnect and power moves between them. So there's obviously a Remain establishment and a Brexit establishment. The power is obviously clearly with the Brexit establishment at the moment. There's like a traditional Tory one, a traditional Labour one, and a populist one. So they all interconnect and interweave with each other. And the whole point is whoever is in power at the moment, you know, they are the establishment, but they rarely see themselves as that. And they always try and paint themselves in a different way because no voter wants to say yes i'm going to vote for them because they're part of some elite it's very very few people think that so boris johnson does that particularly well and he's always done this himself of being an outsider chucking rocks being mischievous um but i think you know many of the leaders have done that too i think andres wanted to jump into yeah, this as well a, cu a couple of thoughts along the same lines uh, no populist who pretends to be anti-establishment comes from outside the establishment. Uh, that is true of Boris Johnson. That is true of Donald Trump. That is true of, you know, Fidel Castro, uh, who ruled Cuba for 50 years. He was a son of the upper middle class and his father had a lot of land. So uh, th th this is an old trick in politics, uh, which was not discovered five years ago and which is not going away anytime soon. Now, on a more optimistic note, um, I would like to think that the popular cycle is a cycle, meaning it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, because I think we're beginning to see, and the US election showed a bit of that, that people's appetite for conflict and anti-establishment uh, friction begins to be moderated by you know, a competing appetite, which is the appetite for normality and effectiveness. It is not a coincidence that the populist governments across the world have been singularly the most incapable of dealing with a pandemic. You know, if you look at deaths per capita, uh, in the UK, they are 35 times what they are in Pakistan. Um, it is not a coincidence that in my part of the world, Brazil and Mexico, both led by populists, have by far the worst death rates. The same is true in India, the same is true in a number of countries of populist governments. So at some point, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not the day after tomorrow, there is a countervailing force here. Uh, so, you know, it may be high time that the liberal Democrats and the centrists begin to think about how it is, that, you know, they or we uh, return to power. Um, and for that, the issues that we discussed earlier, namely, how do liberal Democrats appeal to uh, emotion, not reason, how we put together party platforms that are not simply long shopping lists of policy that nobody understands, etc. I think that's a really difficult but really important task ahead. I, I am terribly sorry. We are at the end of our uh, discussion. 
uh, I thank you so much. There are still so many questions, but yeah, we will, we don't have the time for that. I beg your pardon to all the people that are in the audience. I really do hope that you had a lot of many insights. And I think that all these, like, all the experts, I just want to ask, uh, thank you very much also from my end, um, especially because I think that you all had very interesting and very kind of diverse perspectives, but we all, we had the feeling that it, it all came to the same in the sense of the, we all came to the same feeling about how we can counter this and what what are the, the, the issues at hand uh, and not only for the UK. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I pass over uh, to George. Yes. yes, thank you. Um, I'm sorry we've ended up slightly short on time at the end, but that was a fascinating conversation nonetheless. And thank you very much indeed to all of our speakers for participating in that. Um, thank you especially also to Hannah for stewarding that conversation so ably. Um, to our audience, please do stick around on the same Zoom link. Uh, in After a short 15 minute break, we will be starting the next session on the global climate emergency at 2.30 and it would be great to see you there. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank Bye. Bye. Thanks.